Hey guys, Duke here with another mask review. Now I apologize I haven't made reviews in quite a while. I've been dealing with some uh, an allergy related cough, not Corona. I've been staying indoors and I haven't been going out anywhere really. It's just a bit of allergies due to the grass and all that. But anywho, that's enough about me. Today I have something very special for you because today I have a U.S. Cops Tiso model of 1918 mask. Now, if you haven't already checked out my reviews on the Akron Tiso, I would recommend seeing all of those first to give you some contextual background. But the Cops Tiso was designed by Major Waldemar Cops, a former corset designer from Manhattan, New York, who was then a established officer in the Chemical Warfare Service, who had previously developed the Richardson Flory in Cops mask, which was a amendment to the corrected English type box respirator, which simply just widened the face piece and uh, added a six point harness. However, Waldemar Cops had been sitting back so far and had been watching Dr. William Chauncey Gear and other developers work on the American TSO and then subsequently the Akron TSO. And there had been uh, several other developments in that time as well, but the Akron TSO seemed to be the leading competitor. Waldemar Cops saw that the um, the Akron Tiso was quite difficult to manufacture because of its um, its complex, solidly molded rubber face piece. This is keep in mind this is before they invented injection moldings. So it was all hand patched and calendared, um, but. Anywho, Waldemar Kopps uh, thought that he could improve the design by making a lamp, a multi-laminate face piece, which was die cut and sewn into shape, similar to a CE or RFK style box respirator. But in this case, it was a completely rigid and self-preserving -preser face piece made entirely out of a laminate of cotton sailcloth, stockinette, and an intermediate layer of rubber. Um, this was developed in August of 1918 and then, I believe, approved for production in September of that year as well. And there had been several different variations in the hardware. Original ones used the CE-type lenses, which were the olive-painted pressed aluminum ones. And there was also a threaded lens version, which is, all, is probably the rarest to find. And then the, the version that I have here is the most common with the... Uh, the the black oxide brass pressed lenses, and those would be subsequently used on the more famous Cops Tissot and Monroe mask, which would come in October of that year. Between Oct uh, September and November of 1918, somewhere around uh, 2,000, no, 200,000 of these masks were made. I believe it was more around the ballpark of uh, 337,000, actually. I could be wrong on that. A lot of different sources say different numbers, so I'm going to round it out to 337,000. Um, because the face piece was um, very, despite being easier to produce than the AT, it had multiple seams across the face piece and was therefore more, more complex to produce. It took a lot of labor and um, not only that, but the U.S. Army through testing found out that the masks were utterly useless. The problem was is that the masks had very thin rubber, and so most of the actual protection that the army noticed, because th at the time, this was their favorite out of the two, like they preferred the KT to the AT, um, but they noticed, uh, eventually noticed that the um, face blank of the mask, because of it, it was mostly fabric, most of the protection was because it was actually absorbing the gas rather than providing a perfect seal and keeping a barrier from uh, chemical agents in the, ex in the surrounding environment, and so... That's probably one of the reasons why some uh, a decent chunk of these survive today as opposed to ATs. Like, for a while it was easier to find KTs and ATs simply because the industry did not want them because they, I say that and I've reviewed a industrialized KT, but keep in mind, the industry very rarely picked these off. They mostly went after ATs. And then these were also used only as a training mask post-World War One. I. I believe the ATs did get some minor usage in the 20s, but that's probably negligible, and both the AT and KT saw service as a training mask up until the 1930s. Um, but anywho, the, a lot of these um, are typically found in decent condition, however they are very, like the AT, they are petrified because of the thin rubber obviously being susceptible to age, and it, it hardens. So I could potentially reopen the face piece up by steaming it, but I'm not going to attempt that for now. But before I ramble on any further, let's get into the actual review, and I'd like to thank the person who pointed this out to me, who know, you know who you are, and I'd like to thank Moulage for helping me afford this, because this only cost us a meager $175. The last time I've seen a KT come up for sale, it went for over $500, so very good deal on this one. But starting off, we have the M1 chest carrier here, which um, does have some date stamps. The 40th week of 1918 brings us to October of that year. You have a 
AO, which is probably the person who got issued and was testing this, because like the AT, these were not these did not see combat. These were only shipped overseas to France for um, testing purposes, and then obviously they were used a lot stateside for training purposes. Um, but anywho, there's the uh, interior. I doubt you can really see inside all that well. Um, there is a coiled spring on the bottom there to support the canister, and then this side would be for the face piece. And obviously the face piece itself, being stored in the carrier for so long, is quite crumpled up. Um, but moving on from that, you have the anti-dimming composition, which would probably also... It could either be the Tiso type anti-dimming stick or one of these. I haven't actually seen a K... I, I might have seen like one KT that came with the, uh, the, the bluish-gray Tiso type anti-dimming cloths, but... or anti-dimming sticks, but this one has just a, uh... Uh, the, the mustard yellow colored ones. And then moving on to the mask itself, starting with the canister, you have the uh, the gas ID and repair plaster booklet uh, 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 attached to the canister stem by a uh, whipcord, or just some cord. And then the uh, there's nothing inside here, There's no, nobody wrote anything down, but uh, the canister itself has a few markings on it. This is a type L canister, not a type J. Um, if you can look there, Hopefully you can I can get the camera zeroed in on that. Give me a minute. I have to hold this very peculiar uh, awkwardly. But there it, it says right there. Oh come on camera. Give it one moment, folks. There we go. It says PMW Co. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I actually thought it, this was Canco because it's it's common to find the Canco marked uh, filters, but this one's PN or PMW Co. So if anyone knows what that means before I ultimately find it out, maybe update in the description, let me know. On the top here, um, you have a serial number here. You have a 312XL, and the L is the canister type. Um, the X would refer to like a number of some sort. It, it refers to like the end of the number, I believe. And then below there, you can see what would probably be another PMW Co. stamp, but there's remnants of tape. Um, and what people would do when they get TSO masks is they would put a piece of tape on the top of the canister and they would mark their name on it just to make sure that nobody stole it and was using experimental equipment other than the person it was issued to. And now getting a look at the face piece itself, um, you have a stamp on the side here, which is, if we can get the camera zoomed in on that, it is 100 and, let's see, 100, no, excuse me, 1, 130,379, so... And that X there refers to the end of the number, as I said, and that's obviously mask number. So this is the this is the one hundred thirty thousandth, three hundred seventieth faith uh, KT face piece produced. Excuse my slurring. Um, and you can see the seams and how um, the, the 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 weird construction of the face piece, whereas, whereas the border is just entirely rubber lined stockinette, and then the parts that needed to be firm were reinforced with cotton sailcloth. And then you can get a close up of the lens of the mask itself, how it's. Bra it's black oxide brass that's simply pressed into place. There are no other external markings, however the carrier would indicate that this is a size 3. I know that some of these were were stamped potentially in like size, medium, and large stamps as the ATs were, uh, but again, I haven't seen really any of those physically existing. Uh, you have the flutter valve post on the bottom. And that was another thing the KT was ingenious for, is having a separate uh, inlet and outlet valve assembly or angle assembly because that simplified the cost of production and obviously these were threaded. I can't unthread them unfortunately because you know it's a hundred years old and it's stuck together but these assemblies could unthread if they needed to replace the mask and so that was a very good design. Um, you have the flutter valve guard. No rust on this. Everything's in perfect condition in terms of the metal. Uh, the face piece obviously is a bit dilapidated um, but that gives you a general idea of what it's like. I will try to show off the harness and the interior here. Uh, this KT, I, I've seen, uh, the KT pretty much uses the same harness as the AT, where it is a triangular six-point elastic, which unfortunately is all stretched out, with a cross strap on the top there, and you can have two buckles on the sides for temple adjustment. Nothing really different about that from the AT. And then inverting the harness, I will show off the interior. There really isn't too much to see, because unfortunately most of the uh, important features are gone. The face piece is just flexible enough to get a piece of newspaper in and out, which I will probably be replacing with some proper acid-free packing paper. That's just what the seller provided. Um, but hopefully I can get a view in here. Um, give me one moment, folks. I'm going to get a light so you can see that better. So I'm going to step over here for one moment. All right. So, looking inside the face piece, you can see that there is the remnants of the original deflector right there. Um, that would have been sort of a... 
a taco or a butterfly shape uh, that would have protruded up into the lenses a little bit more. And that obviously the air came in through there. You could see the nut where it's holding that um, that hose angle on and it would have deflected the air up at the lenses obviously. And then down there you can see the, the brass port where the air would exhale from through the flutter valve. And right here you can also see a chin strap because um, the ATs had a chin rest, this, the KT had like a chin strap, sort of like German masks, um, but that provided some support for the chin and made sure that the, the bottom of the chin piece didn't cut into the neck. Um, so there is some markings on the forehead up in there somewhere. Uh, I can't access them very well, they're just up there between the lenses. Um, hopefully you can sort of see, but uh, I doubt you can really, but they're up there. Probably just a serial number. Not really much else to see, it's very barren inside, and you can see the uh, the gaskets for the lenses in between the glass and the pressed brass frames there. Um, and that's really it. Um, so that is the uh, Cops T-Cell Mask. Very thankful to have this. Very been wanting one of these in my collection for a while and very excited to finally have one. So that pretty much wraps it up. Again, check out my previous uh, Akron T-Cell reviews if you want more history on World War I era masks. And obviously I have a RFK uh, review as well, so go ahead and check that out. Um, I'm Duke. I uh, hope you enjoyed. If you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them down in the comments below, and I will see you all later.